Good morning. morning. And welcome to Grace Fellowship in a time of worship in our Lord and Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. One announcement this morning is we've had an overwhelming response to a women's Bible study that was supposed to happen at Janelle Patton's house. It will be at Grace Fellowship due to the amount of response. Now that's a real praise item. As we open for worship this morning, I also want to bring to your attention uh, that we're going to be praying for the church in Lake Park, the Methodist Church has voted to leave the Methodist, and the church in Harris has voted to leave the Methodist. So please keep those churches in your prayer. That journey has just begun. It has changed. The process is different than when we did it, so please keep them in prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, We do thank you for those kids who just walked out of here and they're going to go and they're going to worship and they're going to receive the word. Let their hearts be open to it. The kids are so vulnerable and we pray for their protection. The enemy has no place upon their hearts or in their homes. Protect them in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for these congregations that already have disaffiliated with the Lutheran body, Methodist body, and those that are in process. They need that fullness of the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, direct them. Give them the ability to reach out for help. And they're making a stand for the kingdom of God. And we pray directly to the evil, the dynamic forces that come against these that this process is protected, that the angels of the Lord come, and the Holy Spirit fills the hearts to guide them. We thank you in advance for what you've already done. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, that's exciting stuff. I had a guy tell me last week, he says, you know what, grace is an oasis in the midst of a very dark spot in northwest Iowa. God's moving. There's no doubt. It's not just us. He's moving, and we know the trumpet's going to blow. We're going to be ready for when we hear that and say, hallelujah, here we go. I've told you that's the Dust Bowl part. Uh, We're going to be part of that. (laughs) Some of you are looking at me like, what? Well, the dead rise first in Christ, so we're all in the ashes, and when the graves open and all the dust comes together and we meet Christ in the sky, we're going up, we meet him in the sky. I don't know about you, but that's going to be exciting if I'm still alive when it happens. Today we're going to continue to investigate and look at the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to just give you a brief video this morning. I love it. I, I, I titled this series Erased for the specific reason teaching has been erased from Scripture. Not, not at all. It has been erased from a lot of the teachings, a lot of the churches, and a lot of the denominational systems today. So this series has been titled Erased for that reason. I grew up in a church where I never heard a teaching on the Holy Spirit. Uh, I love the denomination I grew up in. They're still very biblical. They just leave pieces out. I went to a seminary where I got my master's of theology, where the teaching of the Holy Spirit was void. And my class confronted the teachers. We were like, something's missing here. My dogmatic theology, uh, systematic theology, had the person of the Father, had the person of the Son, but we did not have the person of the Holy Spirit. And the the dean of admissions, the professor that was the head of that department, I went to him, and my whole class did, there was nine of us. And he said, it comes under the the teaching of the Son, the, the Jesus the Christ. And we were like, but he's the third person of the Trinity. Why doesn't he get equal time? And he tried to give us this big explanation. So he made us buy $500 worth of books. 
I have a systematic theology volume now that has a separate teaching on the Holy Spirit that we never opened. That's how he satisfied us. So it's been a passion of mine to, to make sure that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all get equal time in teaching. Now, erased. The Holy Spirit's teaching has been erased for a reason. And the simplest explanation I can give you on that is because the devil himself, the, 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 the evil world, knows that if there's teaching on the Holy Spirit, he can squash the power of the kingdom of God that the church is called to be. He knows that, and it's happened, and it's happening. But at the same time, what we're seeing on the other side of that coin right now, there's a revival that's coming, the, the evil's coming, and the revival's coming, and we're seeing the new bride of Christ emerge as we talk, as these churches leave, it's emerging. And we're starting to see this bride come together. Now, the bride is the true believer in Jesus Christ, moved by the Holy Spirit. Christ is the head of the church, and stuff happens. Healings happen. People get saved. That's the body of Christ. That's why it's so important to learn and to teach about the Holy Spirit. Last week, he is a person. He's not weird. Everybody said? He's not weird. He's a person. And he is God. Don't miss that. He is God. And you can pray to the Holy Spirit. In fact, I encourage you to pray to the Holy Spirit. So, couple of words today. I'm, I'm just going to flush out two words today and is Pentecost for us so that you don't fear it. Grace Fellowship is a Pentecostal church. Now some of you right there are like, oh, because we fear the word Pentecostal, okay? And I'm going to explain that word to you and you're going to leave here today think, <laughs> man, because I, I don't want you to fear that at all. And I don't want you to fear the word tongues. And we're going to explain that one too. Here, here's what happens. There's something somewhere in your background that causes you to, the minute I said that word, you're, uh-oh. Well, you know what that means? That means we believe this book to be the true word of God. That's what Pentecostal means. It means that we believe in water baptism. We believe in a confession of faith into Jesus Christ. We believe in the spiritual baptism. We believe in the word of God. It causes us to be Pentecostal. It's a biblical word. Some of you right now are thinking, Ooh, we're Pentecostal church. Yes, we are. And I'm going to explain that to you. We're a Bible-believing, Christ-centered church. And that's part of it. There's three feasts. I'm just going to give you a quick background here because you really need to understand the feast to understand why we are believers in Pentecost. Number one is the feast of Passover. All of this originates in the Old Testament. Passover was when they put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel passed over and the children of Israel were relieved from the bondage of, of slavery and they go through baptism, the Red Seas parted and they end up at the foot of Mount Sinai. That started with Passover. God gave them the date, he gave them how, he gave them everything how that was to happen. Jesus fulfilled Passover. When you go back into the Old Testament, especially in Leviticus, and, and you read this, the day he was crucified, the day he came out of the tomb, everything matches Passover. Now, Pentecost is the second feast which they celebrated in the Old Testament. Then you have the Feast of Tabernacles. As some of you are saying right now, like, what? but no, you, you got to get these three feasts. So you got Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. Within each feast, the first two, Pentecost, there's three feet, or Passover, there's three separate. Pentecost, there's three separate. Tabernacles has one. Equals seven. Within those feasts. Now, here's what you're going to learn today. We don't have any problem celebrating Passover. In fact, we get all dressed up, we buy new dresses, we have a great celebration when we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Amen? No problem. 
We don't have any problem celebrating tabernacles, which within tabernacles, the feast is the feast of trumpets, which is judgment. When that trumpet blew, the children of Israel knew they were under judgment. Guess what our trumpet is? That's when Jesus is going to return. And when that trumpet blows, there's judgment. We don't have any problem with that. In fact, we get excited about the Feast of Tabernacles when the trumpet blows. And we pass right over Pentecost. For me, understanding the power of Pentecost, we need to be celebrating that feast as much as Resurrection Sunday. Because in the Old Testament, we have God the Father through the work of the Son, through the work of the Holy Spirit, where he comes and goes. He, he comes upon the prophets. He, he's with David. David says in Psalm 51, take not your Holy Spirit from me. He comes and goes. Move into the New Testament, you have Jesus, and he's with them in Christ form. The Holy Spirit is with them. But then when he ascends, he says he's going to come, and now we live in a period where the Holy Spirit is in us. Now, I don't know about you, but being around is one thing, and being with them is one thing, but to be in us. The Holy Spirit is the most important figure in all of Scripture in the time of history we live in. He reveals the Father to us. He, he moves in the church. And the problem we have is you have a negative remembrance or occurrence where it became a negative thing to you. Some of you went to a church service where they were speaking in tongues. They weren't biblical. They were dancing. They were jumping. They were moving. They were tipping over. A lot of that's not biblical. So you've got this experience. It's like, ugh. And I get that, and I want to remove that today. What is it? Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, they've been waiting. Remember, Jesus fulfilled the feast. He came out of the tomb, walked on the earth for 40 days, sends into heaven. Ten days later, we get this event. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Remember, the Holy Spirit is in the form of fire, wind, oil. It's not the Spirit. It's how he moves. Rushing wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared on them and rested on each one of them. I had a dear brother tell me, after I preached a sermon something like this, he said, Pastor, I will not believe in Pentecost until I see fire on top of people's heads. Bad experience. I'm going to explain that fire thing this morning. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utter utterance. That sentence causes so many people, they're speaking in other tongues. Ooh, what's that about? Again, negative experience. You, you want to know what the word tongues mean? <laughs> Let's just eliminate all the bad experiences. Glossia. That's the Greek word. Now, those of you who are English, what's that cross over to? Glossary. What's that mean? Language. That's what the word means. And you've been afraid of it all these years. Simply means language. Speaking in other tongues as the spirits gave them utterance, now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews. Devout men from 15 nations were there. How many nations? Every. Every nation under the sun was present at the inaugural service of the Holy Spirit. Every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, they were confused, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Don't be afraid of tongues. Language. Language of every person, every nation under the sun, and they could hear it. The fulfillment of the Feast of Passover. Death angel passes over. Moved to Mount Sinai, it's 50 days later, 
Pastor Lynn doesn't just give you my assumptions and my opinions. Look at Leviticus 23, 15, and 16. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. Jesus died on Wednesday. He's in the tomb Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Jewish day starts at 6 p.m. So anytime coming out of the tomb after 6 p.m. on Saturday is the first day of the week. Saturday was the Sabbath. You shall count seven full weeks after the Sabbath. What's seven times seven? 49. Then there's the wave offering, the grain offering. I'm not going to get into that this morning. The sheaf of the wave offering, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Our God is so cool. Scripture is so intertwined. God knew Jesus would come out of the tomb on that first day of the week. He knew he would walk on the earth for 40 days. He knew he would ascend into heaven. And he knew that the Holy Spirit would be outpoured on the 50th day set forth in the Old Testament. It's all there. It wasn't new. They were celebrating the Feast of Pentecost right there. Now, Jesus fulfilled all of that. And he came out of that tomb on the day that God said, when they left Israel, when they left Egypt, and they went 50 days later to the foot of Mount Sinai, Something happened. Not one was sick, not one was lame, nobody was hurt. God blessed them, he took care of them. They took the gold and silver out of Egypt with them. They plundered them and everything was good. God was light, God was sun. And they get to the foot of Mount Sinai and Moses goes up the hill for 40 days. And what do they do? They commit adultery. They build a golden calf, which is right in the law that God was going to get. So God gives them the law. They build a golden calf. He says, shame on you. Moses breaks all Ten Commandments at once. He's the first guy to do that. There's my lame joke today. They grind. God says, here's what you do with the golden calf. You, you grind it into dust. He made them drink it. And those who rebelled, the earth opened up and 3,000 people died on the giving of the law. Fast forward this to Pentecost. Before I tell you the beautiful part about Pentecost, there's another Old Testament parallel here that happened. Genesis chapter 11, we have the Tower of Babel. Pride, arrogance, we're going to build a tower, we're going to get to God, and we're going to show God how great thou art. And they're building the tower, they're all coming together, they're speaking how many languages? One. One. God comes down and says, you prideful individuals, he scatters them, he changes their language, and they go about the whole earth. They're scattered. Pentecost, Pentecost happens, God brings all the people back together, and the disciples, the 120 people in the upper room, speak the language that everybody can hear, and God gathers all the people of how many nations did I say? Every nation, and he gathers them all back together on Pentecost. Whew. You just get goosebumps. That's our God. The confusion and the disorientation he caused at Babylon in Pentecost, he brings back together. And he's gathering. He says, here's the kingdom of God. Not only that, but on the law, when he gave the law, and he goes, here's what you got to live by because you're disobedient to me. And they never could. Flip that over on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit writes the grace, the gospel message on their heart, 3,000 people got saved. It's no coincidence that it's the same number. Under law, 3,000 died. Under the gospel writing on their heart, 3,000 people got saved. That's Pentecost. And we don't want to celebrate it because you're afraid of the word. So let me tell you what the word means. Penta, always tell the confirmation kids, you, you never forget it. Penta is what? Five. We've got a guy here that worked in the Pentagon. Five. Costa times a tenth power. Fifty. Penta costa. Pentecost. Pentecost. This big scary word. Oh no, because pastor's dancing and, and we're doing all this stuff because it's Pentecost. And you know what the word means? Fifty. Get over it. 
Seriously, when I tell people that, I said the word means 50. Oh, it doesn't mean that we're going to swing from the chandeliers, and it doesn't mean all these negative things that you have about yourself. It means 50. But the 50 that I just explained to you is so important because our God orchestrated this. Our God put this together. Our God wants you to know that when you are saved and you receive the Holy Spirit, he writes the gospel on your heart and he convicts you that you're his righteousness. You are now in right standing with God. That's the beauty of Pentecost, 50. That's what it is. It's the blessed reversal of the curse that came from Babylon and that what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai is now reversed. Pentecost, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God gave the law, they couldn't keep it, and now he gave the grace through the gospel, and we receive it. Pentecost, simple as that. He reminds you of your right standing with God the Father. If you think for a moment that you can go through this life, you can go through this journey of life, fallen, broken, evil, busted, disgusting world, without the Holy Spirit, you got a rude awakening. You, you can't love. You can't forgive. You can't receive. In fact, Scripture says you can't say the name of Jesus the Christ without the Holy Spirit. And I tell you what, there is something that is starting to bother me so bad, and I, it's like we got to be the example is the language. I mean, Ginger and I have turned off more movies lately because of the language. And it, it's almost like, you know, I can tolerate, tolerate kind of sometimes words that society does not accept. But when they start moving into taking my God's name in vain, and they start doing JC and GD this, and, and on television, in movies, it's like, okay, that's that. And it, it's like, we don't need the Holy Spirit because we know better. We can do, and I tell teenagers, I tell kids all the time, if you don't have any better adjectives than the F word and the S word, you look terrible. You can't speak without those words. You're not spirit-filled. The Holy Spirit is the one that guides us in this process, leads us in this process, causes me to forgive my neighbor, causes me to love my wife. Guys, if any of you think you can love your wife the way Scripture says that you will die for her without the Holy Spirit, you will never do it. Ever. Ever. Gals, if you think you can love your man, love your kids the way God wants you to love them without the Holy Spirit, you will never get close to doing it. You can't. Why? It's because we got a broken nature. We're broken. Sin. We did a wedding Friday night. I told the kids, I said, I looked at him and I said, no more girlfriends in their, in their little wedding sermon. He looked at me. And I said, Here, here's the problem, because so many people think, yeah, but I got this person at work, it's the opposite sex, and I can talk to her on the break, and everything is good, and she listens to me, you know? And we spend more time with people at work than we do with our spouse. I said, that's over. No more girlfriends. Okay. <laughs> then I looked at her, and I said, same thing, no more boyfriends. You, you don't get that special guy that understands you. You know how many times I've heard that? Yeah, but he understands me. Well, what about your husband? He doesn't understand me. Well, maybe you should talk to him. Anyway, without, amen, without the Holy Spirit is my point. It doesn't happen. It cannot happen. It will not happen. Hence the reason you need to pray to the Holy Spirit. If you're saved and you have the Spirit, you need to be in prayer to him. Acts 1, 4 through 6. The promise. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. Ordered. Heavy language. Oh, by the way, divided tongues. 
I'll get there. Stan, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Do you believe the promises in Scripture? Yeah. All of them. And this is one of them. And, and we just want to skip over Pentecost. But it's a promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, Jesus speaking, John the Baptist baptized with with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You know how many people skip over this verse and they're like, oh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Freaky. No, it's not. It's a promise of the Father. The divided tongues, the fire sat on their heads as divided tongues. And the guy that told me, he says, I'm not going to believe in Pentecost unless I see fire on top of somebody's head. How do you believe by the famous F word, I teach the confirmation kids, faith. We believe in Jesus Christ by faith. We believe that tomb is empty by faith. We believe the whole word of God by faith. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the power by faith. How many of you have ordered a pizza? You've ordered a pizza. And you take a piece of the pizza and you give it to your kids. Now, did they get the whole ingredients of the whole pizza? Yes, they did. They got a piece of the pizza of the whole fires on top of everybody's head they got a piece of the whole divided tongues vid in greek they've got a piece of the holy spirit they all got the same now pentecost is for us it's a promise of the father is this for me yes is it for me yes these guys were saved the day Jesus came out of that tomb. When you read John chapter 20, he breathed the Holy Spirit on them and they received it. They were saved. You know how many people go through their Christian life understanding salvation, but they've never received the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is the giving, the outpouring, the fullness, the obedience of the Spirit. I told you, taught you that two weeks ago. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is being obedient. So today, to be obedient, is this for me? Remember, we got the Feast of Passover. We got the Feast of Pentecost. We got the Feast of Tabernacles. We glide right over Pentecost. Can't wait till that trumpet blows. But in the meantime, I'm going to suffer. I had a guy tell me last week, and I can't wait to get together with him again. He goes, the kingdom of God is right there behind that door. I was like, what? And I let him explain that. He says, you know, I'm a I'm, I'm believer, but that kingdom's going to come, and it's right there behind that door. No. Jesus came. The kingdom is here. Jesus ascended. The Holy Spirit came. The kingdom is here. Jesus said and taught the kingdom of God is here. It's not behind the door. Another negative teaching. Is it for us? Yes, it is. Can you receive the fulfillment of the Pentecost feast? Yes, you can. And some of you never have because you've got a negative experience in your life that's stopping it. Penta means what? Fifty. Five. Fifty. Tongues is what? Language. Don't fear these things. There's a little book, and if you want to go home and order it, it's worth the read. Peter Lord. Peter Lord wrote a book called Turkeys and Eagles. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good little read. An eagle fell out of the nest, and he landed in a herd of turkeys. So the turkeys raised the eagle as if he was a turkey, never knowing he was an eagle. You know where I'm going with this. One day, the eagle walking with the turkeys, wild turkeys do fly. You ever see it? They don't really fly. They kind of glide. They get up a little bit, and then they glide. They're not big flyers. Big birds. 
Well, they do sit up in the trees pretty high. Anyway, uh, one day the eagle on the ground with the turkeys looks up at an eagle and says, I wish I was one of them, gliding high above, looking at the land. But here I am pecking in the dirt. Lord is writing this book. And the Holy Spirit sits him down and says, you have never received me. This is a spirit-filled pastor, so he believed, writing the book of turkeys and eagles. And he's like, what? You don't know me, God said to him. And he said, yeah, I do. No, you don't know me. The next sentence was, your mother-in-law lives in your house with you. Yeah, she does, Lord. You have never received her. <laughs> that was a zinger because he didn't like his mother-in-law and he wished she wasn't in the house with him. And God pointed out and said, you have never received her. What are you going to say? God, you don't know me. <laughs> no, he said, Lord, you're right. You're right. So he said, you're living in the house, you got your mother-in-law in the house, and you have never received your mother-in-law, but she's in the house, and you're taking care of her, and you're part of the family, but you have not received her. What's your point, God? You have never received my spirit. Read the book. It changed his life, of course. Changed the outcome of the book, Turkeys and Eagles. That day he realized he was an eagle. And he had in him what it took to be the child of God, to be the kingdom changer, to be the proclaimer of the good news. He had it all, but he had never received the Spirit. Now, I know some of you right now are even thinking today, yeah, but I'm saved. Yeah, you're saved. You got 100% of the Holy Spirit, but being obedient is when you're filled, the obedience is the promise of the Father. I want to give to you. As Lord learned, he was in the house, but he had never received him. So my question remains to you, as you've heard me say before, you have the Holy Spirit, but does he have you? That's what it comes down to. Pentecost isn't scary. Tongues isn't scary. But does he have you? Are you listening to him? Pentecost is for the believer. We're a body, a church. We're not, we're not celebrating Passover and skipping to tabernacles and can't wait for the trumpet. No, Pentecost is part of who we are. It's for the believer. And does he have you? That's our God. He's orchestrated the whole thing. He's got everything from the end to the beginning filled. I don't want you to leave here today taking this information and saying no. Because if you do, you're saying, I don't need the Holy Spirit today. I can do this life on my own. How's that working for you? You can't. And as a Spirit-filled church, we want you to stop holding him at bay. You know what I mean when I say that. You've, you've all had that moment where it's like, I need to do, no, Holy Spirit, get the right adjective, let him fill, be obedient. It's a, it's a life changer. It is. Pentecost, it's for us today. I'm going to pray. And if that tongue of fire you feel has never been ignited in you, you, you don't have to come up front. We don't have to lay hands on you. You can just be right where you're at and say, today, I want that Pentecost experience. I, I want that welcoming of the Spirit that's already in my house. But I've held him at bay. I've always been a little bit afraid of him, but I've held him at bay. Today is the day that we're not holding at bay. We're going to welcome that and say, I want to walk in the Pentecostal experience 
Don't be afraid of that word. Stop holding him at a distance. God wants that for all of us. Let's pray. Father, we do get excited. Your, your word is exciting. When we take the time to even go back and we feel like, well, Leviticus, who reads the book of Leviticus? But when we take the time and to know how your word fulfills every desire and need of our heart, when we learn that you are a God who wants the best for us all the time, not just on Wednesday mornings, not just on Sunday morning, but you want the best for us all the time. When we realize that you're a God, that, that the sin has been removed and you don't remember it, but we're still dragging it around, that, that's the convicting of the Spirit to say, you are righteous before God. You've been made right by the blood. That's the Spirit. Father, we know that there's revival. We know that there's change. And we don't want to hold the power of the Holy Spirit at bay. We want to be part of that kingdom as a body of believers that you've called us to be. So I pray for every heart here today. If Pentecost has been a scary word, if tongues has been a scary word, if the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, has been a scary thought, Father, let that melt away today. And let the believer, let the, let the confessing believer today just simply come before you and say, I, I, I receive the Pentecost experience by faith. And I give you a moment between you and the Holy Spirit and Jesus the Christ and the Father. Let that all come together and you can confess that right where you're at. I, I want to receive the Holy Spirit's movement in my life by faith. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that the, the minds and the individuals, the personalities that have had that negative experience, that that's erased. And today, maybe for the first time, as they receive it by faith, they realize the beauty and the power, the grace and the mercy. When you write your love gospel of grace on our heart, we can do nothing but receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The disciples, Father, came to your son, Jesus. They sat down and said, hey, Jesus, we want to pray like you. And this is what you taught them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. we go today receiving those words you're not against us you're for us God will bless you God will keep you makes his face shine on you he's gracious to you turns his face towards you and grants you his peace in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen Go in peace today. Serve the Lord.